strength rather than gains of price is because of thing, the way I think it's going to be in 10 years. And plus, it's funner to talk about the speculative future than about the dangerous present. And so uh, I'm just going to I'm just going to talk a little bit about where where I some of the three kind of key trends I think are going to shape the future of uh, buying things, the future of shopping, and consequently the future of brands. And the first is that uh, uh, I, Jerry's last slide is a myth that it only helps small companies. Well, it's a myth that social media only helps small companies. But when I look at technology broadly. I see that it mostly helps small companies. It allows small companies to be very competitive with big companies. And then in traditional economics, the point of the firm was to overcome barriers of entry to the marketplace. And technology, not just social media, but hell, even the, even the color printer, an affordable color printer, is dramatically leveling barriers of entry to the marketplace for all kinds of firms, making it less and less advantageous to be a large firm. Now, when I have argued this before, people say, what about Google and eBay? And the truth is there'll be a few, a handful, maybe you'll be able to count them on 10 hands of gigantic companies that provide platforms and infrastructure for millions and millions and millions of small companies that as barriers to the entry of the marketplace get just demolished by technology from fabrication technology and fabricating things in China to uh, to, to information flow and knowledge management, we're just, it, it gets harder and harder to have any advantage as a large company. The second trend I see that I think is really going to be, is going to dramatically change the way we shop, is fabrication and nanotechnology. You'll see these are three different models of 3D printers you can buy. These 3D printers currently run about five grand a pop. But believe me, in the next 10 years, I think every American will have a 3D printer in their home. And the next time you want a new pair of tennis shoes, you'll go on the internet, and you'll find the blueprints for the shoes you want, and your printer will print them for you, and you'll wear them the next day, right? I think that's the future of fabrication, and nanotechnology will help us get there. And if you think that's not where we're at, then the whole reason Walmart exists is the declining cost of fabrication in smaller and smaller quantities in, you know, in places like China. And the technology that makes that possible is moving into your home. And so this is just going to change shopping. Now, when I was doing these slides for my wife yesterday, she said, what about retail therapy? Right? She says, I'm just not going to want to print things. I like to go to stores and look at things. That experience. Well, I think that's gonna I think that's gonna change because of social networking and what uh, Emily is gonna talk about mobility. I think that when you walk down the aisle of the supermarket, it's gonna notice your phone, it's gonna look up your social network, and it's gonna say, Hey Nico, your mother really wants you to buy this. <laughs> so, or when my wife is in the when well, my wife is shopping and she walks into a store, it's gonna say, Your sister loves this handbag. Right? And it's going to be less about brands and more about your social network and the relationships you have with people you care about and what they, what they believe about specific products. So those are kind of three trends that I see for the future. And in, in all three instances, in the decline, in kind of the rise of, uh, in the decline of barriers to entry the marketplace and the redefinition of the traditional firm, in the, in the rise of fabrication and 3D printing, and in the role of social networking plus mobility plus shopping, uh, I see brands mattering less and less across the board. Um, uh, and then, you know, the, you're probably all familiar with the Forrester book on the groundswell. The, this is kind of the thesis of the groundswell. This is, a, I forgot to tell you what this is. This is a visual representation. This is a visual representation of the internet. It's, a, it's actually a, 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 almost 10 years old at this point, but that's because the more recent ones are so dense they look almost solid. But this is what the internet looks like. It is lots of tiny distributed nodes, relationships. And you know, those of you familiar with uh, Charlene Lee's uh, book and Josh Brown's book, The Groundswell, the thesis of The Groundswell is that people, technology allows people to connect with each other and so they're, they're not interested in connecting through institutions. Institutions are less important to them. That's corporations, that's governments, that's nonprofits. They can connect to each other. They don't need the institution. And so when I think about the way I think this is going, it looks to me like that's dangerous. That's dangerous for brands. Now, 
I'm gonna, I'm also just gonna change gears and talk about the present very quickly. One of my uh, graduate students at Harvard last year had done a lot of social media work for Chevron. And she was describing how Chevron had built all these incredible social media things, including this video game called Energyville, which they built with the Economist Group, which was to try and accurately represent the impact of fossil fuels, right? This is about kind of how dangerous burning oil is. <laughs> Chevron built this game. And basically, no one wanted to play it because they thought that there wasn't any way Chevron could tell the truth, right? And so there, this is kind of an interesting challenge in, in the existing social media dynamic where uh, authenticity matters so much that uh, how, does a, how, does a brand, how does a brand possibly get over what was their strength for so long? <coughs> this is especially uh, interesting when you look at their Twitter feed. You'll see Justin H. runs their Twitter. It's not the Chevron Twitter feed. It's Justin H. from Chevron the official Twitterer, right? And mostly what he does is reply to people. And when I think about the best way for companies to utilize social media right now, it strikes me as a great way to do customer service because it <coughs> connects people to people. Um, and it strikes me as very dangerous for brands. So, you know, it's a Rorschach lot. You figure out what the future looks like. <laughs> I think particularly in the age we're moving into with uh, social media, it's always been true, but uh, brands should always be servants, and, and it's particularly true now uh, with social media. I want to talk about a couple of things from a different different angle, uh, touching on some of the stuff Nico, Nico talked about. Um, we are, there, this whole thing from, is a different shift in not just media, but in power. Um, and it's very much uh, like the printing press. Uh, before the printing press, we had, um, you had to be extremely wealthy or an institution, and you had to be able to afford a monk or some other scribe to can write your copy of the Bible or some other important document. And therefore, um, the elites were the keeper of the power, the, people, the keeper of the information. Suddenly, the, the, the uh, printing press happened. And as Jerry, I think, mentioned, the pamphleteers are out there. It's a different, it's like you said, going back to that, that time when suddenly the, the barrier to entry, as Nico pointed out, is Neil. Um, suddenly, Tom, Thomas Paine can put pamphlets out. Revolutions can happen. Well, that's where we are. Because this isn't, uh, this shift from is it the shift in radio and TV? It's not a shift in a, a top-down medium. It is a shift in power. Anybody out there can commit an act of journalism, can, can commit an act that moves your brand, hurts the brand, um, or create a product, a, a, a new something else that threatens the brand. Um, so, social media and technology are totally disrupting and changing the landscape changing how a president's elected in the United States. If people think, well, my company's immune to that, that's just not gonna, not gonna play, play out very well. What did I do with the clicker? Aha, uh -huh. very good. So what happened in, what we've all been trained is uh, we all wanna be Goliath and masters of the universe. Uh, I'm just trying to give you a different way to think about the problem for a minute, uh, because I think this is really important. Um, Goliath, you know, Hertz is number one, and Avis is trying to murder um, because we all want to be the, the uh, master of the universe and the biggest thing out there. And the problem with that is uh, Glenn Reynolds, who's a conservative blogger who I respect very much, wrote a book called The Army of Davids, which is not as good as my book, but <laughs> you might want to pick it up. But after you've read The Revolution, it will not be televised. My book, then go get his. But, he wrote uh, the Army of Davids, and the whole thesis is, is that the internet is, is people are, all those nodes that Nico pointed out, people are able to connect now with each other and exchange information, and they're becoming self-organized armies. Um, and in that world, if you're allowing these Davids to connect, um, you've got to ask yourself how that's changing things. Because it's not about allowing, they're, they're doing it. Um, and so, 
when you think about that for a second, let me, here's some ramifications. 